All right, good morning, everyone. Hope you guys had a good weekend. It's a uh, start of hydrogeology, Geo 420 lecture on the last day of March, 31st, 2020. Um, okay, Zoom lecture beginning. Uh, I'm recording this lecture and I'll post it on Moodle um, as bandwidth allows. Okay, so um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and before we got started on lecture, I wanted to just look at the syllabus and just do a little business before we got into the into the science um, so here's syllabus we are here um, week 12 Um, and uh, we're supposed to be doing unsaturated flow and fracture flow and by a minor miracle I'm relatively on schedule um, so today we're gonna fixture finish up unsaturated flow maybe get into a little bit of fracture flow uh, homework is due on Thursday. Um, please get it in because I would like to grade it over the weekend. And then, um, so please get it in on Thursday. I'd like to grade it over the weekend, get it back to you on the 7th um, so that we can have our exam a week from Thursday on the 9th. Uh, for the exam, it'll be remote delivery. Um, and then, uh, and you'll have to turn it in remotely. Field trip, of course, has been canceled. So, um, <clears throat> after the second exam, I will also hand out um, the outline for your final project, I'm changing what the final project is gonna be as we speak, but um, I'll, I'll give you your, I'll hand out the final project after, so this, this first week after the second exam. Um, bottom line, is that your final project is going to be a report on the hydrogeology of your hometown. Um, so if you want to get started doing a little bit of background research of the hydrogeology of your hometown, you can. Um, I'll hand out uh, a real specific outline for that um, in the coming week or so. All right, so any questions about class schedule? Not seeing any. Um, okay. So then we'll get back to the fun stuff and start talking about unsaturated flow. Um, put this over here. Okay, so <clears throat> let's, uh, let's open up a new page. Uh, and we're going to talk about relative conductivity 
All right, so first of all, let's go back and, uh, and think about our porous media in an unsaturated flow system. So if you have a question, uh, the best thing to do, is, well, I think if you chat me, I'll, I'll see it, but I don't know. But just unmute and ask the question verbally is the easiest for me. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's think about um, the... Just to review, let's uh, let's think about what the pressure head looks like. So, So this is a plot of the pressure head, psi, all right? And starting at land surface, all right? And then at some depth down here, we've got a water table. And over here, psi is negative, and over here, psi is positive. Okay, so I want to start at the land surface. What is my pressure head above the water table? Positive or negative? Negative. All right, starts off negative. Why is it negative above the, above the water table? As the soil substrate has a lot of tension on the water, it's pulling at it. Yeah, it so the, the, the water, we call it negative pressure because the, the water wants to crawl into the capillaries, all right, or it's under tension. So the water wants to um, move into the soil, unsaturated soil capillaries. All right, so we start off, we're negative up here. What do you think happens as I get closer? Well, what's the value of the pressure head at the water table? Zero. All right, so we're zero at the water table. All right, so something happens between here and the water table. Um, curve probably looks something like this. All right. It gets pretty close to the to zero at a distance above the water table um, because we get this saturated capillary fringe, all right, where most of the water is, uh, most of the pores are full of water because tension has pulled water from the water table up into the unsaturated zone. So this area here we call the capillary fringe. Okay, so negative pressure head above the water table. Now we go below the water table. Is my pressure head positive or negative? Positive. Thanks, Colton. All right, and what do you think this line looks like? Once I go below the water table, what is the slope or the shape of the line um, beneath the water table um, look like? What, what does that slope look like? Line. 
It's a straight line. Straight. All right, it increases linearly with depth. So below the water table, the pressure head looks something like that. All right, so this is a map of the pressure head um, above and below the water table. Let's, uh, let's do the same thing here for the Let's do the same thing for fluid saturation, or sorry, volumetric water content. All right, um, actually doesn't make sense for this to have two uh, sides. So I'm gonna actually erase it really quick. Um, let's redraw. Okay, so again, we're at the land surface and we are drawing now the water content. All right, so if it's been a long time since we had our last precipitation event, let's have a volumetric water content here ranging, this would be zero. This over here is N for the porosity. And right here we have theta sub R. That's our residual water content. All right, so if it's been a long time since the last rain, we'll be at the residual water content near the land surface. And again, we got the water table down here at this depth. Okay, so we'll start off here at the residual water content. We'll get more and more saturated as we go down. We're gonna hit uh, full near to full saturation here at the capillary fringe. So this is my capillary fringe. All right, and then once we go below the water table, well, we just stay fully saturated. All right, so this is <clears throat> what both my pressure head and my water content in the soil looks like above and below the water table. Okay, so what I want to do now is think about our representative elementary volume of porous media. So I got a soil. I've got sediment grains in it. All right, and if I'm unsaturated,
Then some of the pore space is full of water. And some of the pore space is full of air. So these are my sediment grains. All right, we talked about this a little bit already, but we uh, intuited that because our um, because our, our hydraulic conductivity is controlled by the pore throats, all right, or the radius of the pore throats, that the less saturated I was, the less pore throats were available and the harder it would be for water to move through my porous media. All right, I got a, so I got another question. As I dry this material out, all right, so I have less and less water, what pore throats will stay saturated? The small ones or the big ones? What are the first pore throats to drain? The big ones will drain first, and then the small ones will be the ones that will still be saturated. Okay, so if I come back at some other time when I've dried, all right, all I'm gonna have is water in these really small pore throats. All right, my dry water would only be in the very smallest of these pore throats. All right, so there's, there's two compounding factors. As we get less saturated, we have less pores in general, but also the size of the pores that the water can move through are getting smaller and smaller. So we really get this as theta water goes down, our hydraulic conductivity of water goes down. All right, um, and that's because we get less pore throats, are saturated, so there's less area for water to move, and the pores become, the pores that are saturated become smaller. All right, so <clears throat> how do we deal with this um, in thinking about how to describe flow through unsaturated media? So Darcy's law or unsaturated. All right, so I'm gonna do a little Q style. So a little Q is equal to something times dH dL. All right, so for regular hydraulic or for saturated flow, this was the hydraulic conductivity times the gradient. But here we're saying that our hydraulic conductivity is changing, all right, depending upon how saturated we are. So we're going to do what we always do when we have something that changes. Um, 
we're going to add in a fudge factor. And this fudge factor is K sub R. All right. And K sub R is called the relative conductivity. All right, and it is a function of the saturation or since the saturation and the pressure head are related, we can also write it as a function of the pressure head. So K sub R is a function of the pressure head. And it varies between zero and one. So it goes between zero and one. So when I'm fully saturated, so this is when theta sub w equals n, and it's zero when theta sub w is equal to theta sub r. All right, so when I am fully saturated, this is one. And Darcy's law is just uh, goes back to my saturated Darcy's law. When I am at my residual saturation, when I've drained my pores as far as they can go, and I only have the smallest pores left that are saturated, my K sub R goes to zero, and I basically don't get any, I can't have fluid flow anymore. All right. And so my Q goes to zero. All right, so relative conductivity gives us a way to modify the hydraulic conductivity as a function of the saturation or the pressure head. So it modifies hydraulic conductivity as a function of psi. Okay, so if I look at now, a, let's make a plot of relative conductivity so here is K sub R, all right? And I got my water table down here. Here's land surface. And K sub R varies between zero and one, all right? And it's been a long time since the last precipitation event. What is the relative hydraulic conductivity at the land surface? Is it zero? Zero. All right. We've drained. We have uh, drained all the way to the residual saturation. So my hydraulic conductivity starts off at zero, my relative hydraulic conductivity. At the water table, what is it? One. One. 
All right. And it follows some curve, something like this. All right. It's pretty close to one for all the area in the capillary fringe. And then after the water table, it stays at one. in the fully saturated conditions all right okay so um so relative conductivity is a way for us to to modify how well fluid can flow um due to the changes in the amount of pores and the size of pores that are saturated um in our in our uh, unsaturated media. Um, so there's two major, um, again, we're gonna, um, we're going to talk about two basic, um, functions for the relative permeability or conductivity. So um, we talked about two different uh, equations for, um, for the water retention curve. And the first was the brooks Corey. So there's the two major equations we're going to use for the relative conductivity are the Brooks Corey and Van Genuchten. So, Brooks Corey. And it gives, it says, uh, we can write the hydraulic conductivity as a function of the pressure head and it is equal to psi sub b over psi two plus three lambda when psi is less than psi b, the bubble entry pressure, and it is equal to one when psi is greater than equal to psi b. All right, so this is the Brooks Corey. It allows me to um, calculate the relative conductivity as a function of two parameters. So psi b and lambda are the same parameters that we had in our, rel in our characteristic curves. So psi B is the air entry pressure. This is the air pressure it would take for to push air into a fully saturated um, uh, porous media. And lambda is some parameter that describes the sorting all right so it basically tells us how what the um what the distribution of big to small pores looks like so this is pore size distribution
Okay, so this is Brooks Corey. The other major equation that we'll consider is the Van Van Genuchten. So here the KR is equal to one minus alpha absolute value of uh, capillary pressure to the beta minus one times one plus alpha absolute to the beta to the negative gamma squared over one plus alpha ab psi beta to the gamma over two. All right, where <clears throat> beta <clears throat> is a fitting, beta and gamma Let's see, beta and alpha are fitting parameters. And gamma has the same, um, gamma has the same definition as it did for the, uh, as it did for the characteristic curve. There's a uh, missing parenthesis in the denominator over there. Um, where's that supposed to go? Okay. There you go. Thanks. All right, so gamma is equal to one minus one over beta. All right, so both of these functions are two different ways to calculate the relative conductivity as a function of the capillary pressure, all right? Um, So there's a whole bunch of other ways to do this, um, but these are the two um, we're gonna stick with in class. Um, the, one of the important things to remember with any of these relative permeability or characteristic curve functions is that they're empirical functions. So they're you know, loosely based on physics and mostly based on data and producing curves that fit the data, but there's many ways to come up with these relationships. And so, you know, um, they don't produce the same results. And so um, anytime you're thinking about unsaturated flow, you have to assume one of these um, functions or relationships between psi 
and uh, and relative conductivity and psi and volumetric water content. And so you, you're gonna, your, the behavior of your system will depend upon which of these functions you choose. Um, practically speaking, they behave pretty similarly. So the differences in your prediction whether you sort of choose Brooks Corey or Van Genoopten won't be huge, but, but they're, they will be different. Okay. So why do we, so, so we have this new form of Darcy's law. And we're going to use it now to write um, Richard's equation. Um, so, so we've got our we've got our new form of Darcy's law for unsaturated flow. Is Dari Darcy's cousin? Yes. Can't you tell? Darcy's. All right, K sub R of psi times K. That's the fully saturated hydraulic conductivity times DH, D. Z, DL, I'll make that DL. Thinking back just a second, are there scenarios or certain disciplines where they you would use Brooks and Corey versus Van Genuchten or another of the relationships? Are there preferential reasons to do one or the other? Um, so Brooks and Corey, it, it has um, a couple really nice features. One is that you can measure the air entry pressure and it's got this very physically tangible um, parameter uh, lambda that describes the pore throat size distribution. So Brooks and Corey is in many respects more physically based um, and thus you know from a aesthetic point of view, a lot of people like it. There's a problem with it, however, and that is this jump from one behavior to another behavior at this uh, psi when it approaches uh, psi sub b, the bubble air entry pressure. So from a practical standpoint, we're gonna talk about this, but when we, when I, so when I run simulations using Richard's equation, uh, which I do a lot, um, we're gonna talk about it. Brooks and Corey is really not stable numerically because of this jump, all right? Conversely, Van Genuchten is fully empirical. It, is, it just has these random fitting parameters, beta and alpha and gamma that's just derived from a fitting parameter. So it has no physics behind it. It's just, hey, this form of equation happens to fit our data. Um, and so aesthetically, that's super unpleasing. That's just the straight up engineering solution to me. You know, I'm not gonna do physics at all. I'm just gonna look at data. But it's smooth. It's a smooth curve. And so numerically, it works very well. So I end up having to use Van Genuchten often because it's uh because it's smooth and behaves well numerically so that so the that's a long answer of saying it sort of depends um on what 
what you're trying to do. And, uh, and I would say the most popular and most used of these equations is the Van Genuchten for this reason, because it's smooth and um, doesn't have this sharp transition. Uh, there are other relationships that people have derived that they say work better uh, across a broader range. Um, but, you know, for the most part, people stick to these two. And I would say the Van Genuchten is, is the most popular. If, you know, so there'll be disciplines where somebody picks one or one of these um, because it seems to behave better. And, and then you just read what other people have done and you use that one. But, but you're never going to, let me put it this way, I've published plenty of papers of, in unsaturated flow and nobody's ever been like, oh, you can't use Van Genucht and you should use Brooks and Corey. That's never been an issue. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, so this is Darcy's for my unsaturated flow. Now we're gonna, we're basically gonna insert this new form of Darcy's into our groundwater flow equation. Um, so remember, um, for saturated flow, uh, our groundwater. So let me write the saturated flow groundwater flow equation. All right, I'm going to do the general one uh, for a confined aquifer. So SS the HDT, so the storage times the change in head with time, the DX, KX, the HDX. Plus D, DY, KY, DH, DY plus D, DZ, KZ, DH, DZ. All right, so the main things that we're gonna have to change to consider unsaturated flow, well, the first is this storage, all right? because now we can drain and fill pores. And then we got to change our hydraulic conductivity because K uh, changes. with saturation or with uh, with water content or as written up here it changes with psi all right so to write um, Richard's equation, we're going to, we're going to make some, let's, let's define a new term to deal. Let's deal first with storage. So let's deal with the storage. Um, and we're going to define moisture capacity. So C sub M is the moisture capacity. All right, and um, 
we're going to define it as the derivative of the volumetric water content. Um, so it's the change in volumetric water content per change in pressure head. All right. So if we go, if we think about our characteristic curve, Um, let's see, this is a uh, negative psi and this is theta sub W and it goes from N to theta sub R. So at theta sub R, this is very negative and as we go to saturated, it goes um, it goes to zero. All right. So d theta d psi is the slope. It's the slope of this guy. So that's my moisture capacity, all right? The slope of this, um, of our characteristic curve. And what it allows us to do is just um, write, we can write our, we can write our um, pore space as a function of psi or vice versa. So it allows us to keep We can write the volumetric water content as a function of psi using this relationship, all right? <clears throat> so, my storage term becomes this, it becomes C sub M plus R S sub S. DH DT. All right, so it's a, it is a function of how much volumetric water content I have and how that's changing, all right? And then, um, so C sub M we defined, R is my saturation. All right, and that is just, remember it's theta sub W over N. All right, so when I'm fully saturated, R equals to one, all right? And when I have no water content, R equals a zero. All right, so my storage term allows me to fill and drain pores. The, when I, um, when I get to a, uh, when I become fully saturated, this goes to zero, all right? This goes to one. And so when I become fully saturated, this now um, reduces to S sub S, which is what I need for um, a fully saturated confined aquifer flow, all right? So the bottom line is this allows me to fill and drain pores. And when I be fully fill my pores, the storage moves to the confined aquifer storage. So this storage is valid for both unsaturated and saturated conditions. All right, so then 
the next thing we got to deal with is this uh, relative conductivity. So <clears throat> this is, we'll call this guy star. We're going to use him in a sec. The next one is relative conductivity. And <clears throat> all we do there is just insert. So for the right hand side, we're just going to insert unsaturated. Darcy's law, so we're going to have k sub r of psi times kx dh dx. So we just insert the relative conductivity. All right, so now I can write, so this will be so this is my right hand side. Now I can write my full Richards equation. C sub M plus R S sub S DH DT is equal to D DX KR sub Psi KX DH DX plus d, dy, kr, psi, ky, dh, dy, plus d, dz, K R sub psi K Z D H D Z. All right, so the main modifications again, well, we dealt with storage. Storage changes. Um, allows drain. So here we're directly draining or filling pores. All right. Um, and we dealt with relative conductivity. All right. So if things become saturated. So if um, saturated, then C sub M goes to zero. Uh, R is equal to one. And K sub R is equal to one. All right, so this goes away. This becomes one. This goes to one, this goes to one, and this goes to one. And so I recover my confined aquifer equ equation. All right, so the, so Richard's equation is valid for unsaturated and saturated flow. Uh, 
Oh, I just learned I've been writing this wrong my whole life. The guys, the 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 last name of the fellow who wrote the paper is Richards. So the apostrophe should be at the end. Uh, okay, Richards equation. I'm going to change it up here. I literally just learned that from a reviewer and a paper that just got published. All right, Richards equation um, is valid. for unsaturated and saturated flow. All right, so it's valid above and below the water table um it will correctly so this works for confined and unconfined aquifers um and above and below the water table. Okay, so in many respects, Richard's equation is our best equation. All right, it, we don't have to make the Dupuy assumption. We don't have to decide whether we're in a confined or an unconfined aquifer. Um, we use the same storage term. So uh, our unconfined and confined aquifer equations um, for the fully saturated flow had different storage terms. This storage term will be the same um, for, uh, you know, the, the value changes as a function of saturation, but the actual equation, we don't have to change it. Um, and it will correctly identify the configuration of the water table. And we can look at fluid flow, magnitude, and direction, both above and below the water table. So it's a great equation, all right? But there's a problem. And we can use Richard's equation to illustrate uh, the difference between two types of partial differential equations. So, um, before we start that, can I ask? Um, yeah. Because we got K sub R from our empirical relationships, is it the same in all directions or is it K sub R? of x, k sub r sub y, and so on? Right, good question. So, so that question, so the question is, is k sub r directionally dependent? Um, in principle, there's no reason why this isn't a tensor and doesn't have directional dependence. In practice, no one ever considers this to be directionally dependent. And so we only use um, k sub r as a modifying term, and it's just dependent upon um, it's just dependent upon uh, saturation um, and not on direction. Um, so so okay. In general, we do not have directional dependence for this. All right. Thanks. And. If you were to measure directional dependence, it would be quite small um, because pore throats are sort of, um, pore throats themselves are randomly aligned. There isn't a lot of reason to think that there's strong 
isotropy in, uh, in case of R. Uh, differential. All right. So I'm going to just look at um, steady state, or not steady state, but um, confined aquifer. Uh, one dimensional flow. All right, just to simplify what I'm writing. So DDX K DH DX. All right. This equation is linear because K is independent K and S sub S are independent. They're independent of H. All right, the my variable that I'm interested in. So they so there's no dependence of K and S. So my parameters that control my equation, so S of S and K are independent of my variable that I'm interested in modeling. All right. Now, a nonlinear differential equation so i'm going to write one dimensional Richard's equation. Oh. D D X K R psi K D H dx. All right. Um, and then let's remember, recall that my head is equal to z plus psi. All right. So what does that tell me? That tells me that my My term right here, my hydraulic conductivity is a function. So here my parameter So here it's k r sub psi. It's a function of head, all right? The variable I'm trying to solve for. So I need to know what my head is before I can calculate the parameter hydraulic conductivity, but I'm trying to solve for head. All right, so this is the definition of a nonlinear equation. My parameters, C sub M and K sub R, they are both functions of the head. All right, and so I need to know what the value of the head is before I know what the value of these parameters are. But if I want to know how to solve this equation, I need to know I'm basically trying to solve for the values of head. So you get this um, circular problem where you need to know head to know this, but you need to know this to know what head is. And that is basically the definition of a nonlinear partial differential equation. Um, so Richards is nonlinear.
Ah, I wrote it wrong again. And that makes its behavior really um, hard to model or hard to solve. So it, 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 um, it makes this equation very hard. to solve. All right, we can still, we can do it, um, but it's very, you know, if we're gonna use a, try and use a groundwater model to solve Richard's equation, um, it is very computationally expensive, all right? And so um, while it, it provides a lot of elegance because it works, for all of our groundwater flow systems, um, one equation. The, the fact that it is so numerically or mathematically difficult to work with means it doesn't get used a whole lot. And we try to figure out ways to use our saturated flow uh, equation or the Dupuy assumption more often. All right, so <clears throat> um, All right, so this is um, basically the, you know, what the end of understanding our moisture or our characteristic curves. So we use the characteristic curves to get this C sub M. All right, so those characteristic curves that you guys were calculating, that essentially allows us to understand the behavior of um, the material in terms of uh, pressure head and saturation. And then relative conductivity allows us to um, modify the hydraulic conductivity as a function of capillary pressure or pressure head. Um, so let's, let's just look at some example of an infiltration rate. All right, so we can use our, our knowledge of unsaturated flow to look at infiltration during, um, during a recharge event. So <clears throat> let's All right, so here's depth, and we're starting at the land surface. And we're going to look at the volumetric water content. 
And we're going to start off a long time. So here's n. Here's theta sub r. So let's start off like we haven't had precipitation for a long time. Um, my water table is down here at the base. And so let's start off. It's been a long time since precipitation. We've drawn this curve. Our saturated, our volumetric water content looks something like this. All right. So this is T equals a zero. All right. Then we start a precipitation event. So we have precip adding water to our surface. And it infiltrates, all right? And so we can drive our water content uh, in the top layer of the soil. We can even saturate it. So this is, this is T1, all right? Sometime after the infiltration event, um, and we call this period infiltration, all right? So we're saturating the top of our water column, all right? Um, eventually, that precip will turn off. And we start to drain the water. So it redistributes. So my saturation goes down up high, but my water drains downward. So this is T2. We call this redistribution. All right, and then finally, we keep draining and water will drain down towards the water table. We call this drainage. At T4, so my water, now my, my water content up high is quite low again and I moved that water content down into my unsaturated zone, right? And then the water that makes it all the way down to the water table becomes recharge. So sorry, is this a stepwise, funk, uh, stepwise situation? No, it's not stepwise at all. These are just two, four times that we've taken a snapshot and thought about the major processes that are occurring. Um, during any one precipitation event, these will, the, the saturation content will smoothly vary between these states. Um, and I'll show you um, an example here of some simulations of unsaturated flow, and you can get a bit of a feeling for what these things look like. Um, but um, basically, these are just four snapshots. It's not stepwise. It smoothly varies from infiltration to various parts of redistribution and drainage. These are just characteristic points in time. Um, one thing we can think about is the infiltration rate so that we do have a function for to calculate the infiltration rate. All 
All right, so the infiltration rate is, is pretty complicated. Let's think about things that might be controlling it. Well, when we first pond a little bit of water on top of our land surface, our, we have very low water content in that soil. So my pressure head is very negative and I have the maximum potential difference, uh, head potential between the surface and, um, and the soil right beneath, right? I'm very negative in my, in my um, pressure head and so I have maximum driving force. But at the same time, my relative hydraulic conductivity is quite a bit lower because I am not very saturated. As time goes on, my pressure head becomes less negative because I saturate these pores up. But my hydraulic conductivity goes up because I have more saturated pores. So the infiltration rate is not constant. And we can write it um, using the green amped function. Q is equal to square root of two over two <laughs> tau to the negative one half plus two thirds minus square root of two over six T to the one half, tau to the one half, plus one minus root two over three tau times K sub S where K sub S is my saturated hydraulic conductivity. <clears throat> Tau is this modified time which is equal to the time since the infiltration started over T plus fancy X fancy X is equal to the HS minus HF All right, and I'll define uh, HS is the ponded water depth. Is the
pressure head. at the wedding front. What do you mean by wedding front? Let's, uh, let me, Good question. I'm going to draw this out and let's look at all of these things. But bottom line, um, let me define the rest of these and then I'm going to draw it out. It's a good question. Theta sub S is the saturated water content. This has to be equal to porosity and theta sub naught is the initial water content. Okay, so let's let's go back and, and think about this. Okay, here's theta sub r, or theta sub w. <clears throat> here's theta sub r, and here's n. All right, so we've got this precip coming down, and we've ponded water at our land surface. Right, and the height of this is the height of my ponded water. All right, so the deeper this is, you might think that the faster we're going to be able to drive water down into the subsurface. So here's a map of our of our volumetric water content at some time after infiltration starts T sub I. All right. So this area right here, this is the wetting front. Right, this is the area where we've brought water at higher saturation and we hit this area down where it was at residual saturation. So this area of enhanced saturation from infiltration. All right, the bottom of that is my wetting front. This here, that's theta sub naught. That was our, um, the value of theta before we started our infiltration event. Um, all right, so this pressure head uh, H sub F, tells me how much driving gradient I have down into the subsurface. So the difference between H sub S and H sub F here, that's my head gradient, essentially. Um, and then um, theta sub naught and theta sub S, or saturated, um, all right, that's another uh, driving force there. And then uh, K sub S is my fully saturated hydraulic conductivity. All right, so this function allows me to plot the infiltration rate as a function of time. 
Um, and in general, what we'll see when we plot this, so we can plot Q. Here's Q and here's time. We'll generally see it starts off really high, comes down and asymptotically reaches a fairly constant value. So infiltration will start high when my driving force is really big. And then as the wetting front moves farther and farther down into the subsurface, it will level off. So, sir, the wetting front moves down to, to HF. Yep. <clears throat> does that curve, as more infiltration occurs, does that curve move to the right? And then the top of the curve kind of like swing back to the left as the water. Well, this is for a constant ponded depth. So let's say I was raining hard enough, I kept one. So green amp works if I'm raining hard enough that I keep a constant ponded depth. So let's say I keep it at one inch. Or I'm right now, what's happening everywhere is I'm melting snow. All right. And so I my snow is melting at a rate and I have sort of a constant saturation of water at my surface. So right after saturation started, all right, my curve would look something like this. It would be only saturated near the top and then it would remain at the residual saturation. And then as time went on, the curve keeps moving down. All right, there's T sub I, and if time kept going on, it would keep moving down. And so my wetting front would continue. My wetting front would start off here, then it goes, the next one's here, and then it's here, and then it's down here. So my wetting front is sort of constantly moving down as long as I'm keeping this ponded water up top. Um, okay. And it will until we fully, even if I stop precipitation, the wetting front still moves down until I drain all the water um, to the water table. All right, let's take a, a quick five minute break and I'll pull up, I got some videos we can look at, um, some <clears throat> videos of water saturation from a Richards equation simulation. Um, and we can look at some of these saturation um, dynamics. Um, so, uh, yeah, five minutes, I'll be back uh, in five. Okay. So, um, just so you guys can think about what's what you're looking at. This is, these are um, groundwater models solving Richard's equation for infiltration on a hill slope. So you've got like this sloping box, all right? Um, and all right, so, um, so my ingredients for solving a differential equation, well, my governing equation is Richard's equation. Um, my boundary conditions, I'm going to apply essentially rain and snow melt across the top of my boundary, right? Um, 
And then I'm going to have the sides and the bottom of this block are no flow boundaries. And then there's a, um, the water drains at this corner of the box in um, like there's a stream that it intersects, all right? So I'm basically applying rain and snow across the top here and it's gonna drain towards the stream. Um, there is a two meter soil zone and then a hundred meter deep bedrock zone. So what we're gonna look at is the simulation results of the um, saturated or the volumetric water content. So um, where you see blue here, it's saturated. And where you see red, there isn't, the volumetric water content is very low, all right? Um, so this shape here, this is the shape of the water table underneath the hill. And, um, and you're gonna see there's a zone here of enhanced saturation in the soil above the bedrock. All right, and that's because the water is infiltrating down through the soil. It hits that bedrock, which has lower hydraulic conductivity, and it tends to pond. Okay, so what I do is I apply um, a uh, water that's taken as snow melt and precipitation, depending on whether there's snow present or not. All you need to know is that during April, May, and June, we melt snow and a whole lot of water infiltrates. And then after April, May, and June, it stays really dry. All right, so July, August, September stays very dry. So this simulation is based upon some hill slopes that we're working on up in Lubrecht. And the precipitation is taken from snow, some snow tails up there. All right, so I'm going to hit play and you're going to look at simulations of the volumetric water content. And I'm going to pause it here right now. All right, so um, these simulations start, they're on water years. And so um, snow melt happens at every, roughly at every 0.6 of a year. So here is a snow melt event. All right, and you can see the saturation increasing in the soil above the bedrock. And then you can see the wetting front or the increased um, saturated conditions moving down into the bedrock. I'm gonna hit play again and what you'll see, you'll watch this wetting front drain down into the bedrock. And then you'll see everything dry back up and you'll see these cyclic, um, wetting events happen. So there's the wetting front moving down. All right. Now it dries up. I'm still redistributing that water that moved down into the water table, recharging. It's very dry up here. All right. And then I get another saturation event, another spring. All right. And then I drive another wetting event down into the bedrock. I dry up up top but I'm still moving water down, redistributing it and recharging the bedrock zone. And, uh, and you can see this happen essentially every spring, we get this big wetting event, we drive our fluid into our bedrock system, recharge it, all right? So this is the dynamics that I wanted you to see are these wetting fronts moving down, um, redistributing, recharging, and then we get another wedding event. You can see the water table rise as the recharge hits the water table. Uh, you can see it really good over here. The water table will rise in response to this recharge event. Um, and so the water table configuration is changing continually throughout the year as the recharge moves the water down, it hits the water table, saturates up those pore spaces, 
And then during the dry season, they drain down to the stream. All right, so that's essentially what these saturated infiltration dynamics look like. Um, and these are Richards flow simulations. So it's solving the full Richards flow equation for the fluid flow, both in the unsaturated zone above the water table and then groundwater flow in the saturated zone below the water table. The two different shapes here, um, well, the configuration of the water table is a function of the hydraulic conductivity of the bedrock. And so um, this simulation on the right has much lower hydraulic conductivity in the bedrock. And when we have that, we actually counterintuitively, we get higher values of saturation in our soil. So the lower the hydraulic conductivity in the mountain block or the bedrock, the more saturated our soil stays. And actually, the higher the water table is up into the mountain. Um, when we have high hydraulic conductivity bedrock, the mountain just drains really easily and it's actually not very saturated um, throughout the entire block. All right, Colton, you and Jacob were asking me about, you know, saturated wedges and things like that. Well, th this simulation is essentially full physics demonstration of what goes on when we look at saturation events on a, on a hill slope. Okay, so any questions on unsaturated flow right now on uh, creating characteristic curves? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so on that model, we could see uh, like, so after the water has infiltrated into the bedrock, it still is um, a wedge, kind of. Yeah, it's thinner at the higher point. Can you, can you talk more about why that is? Why wouldn't it just be like a solid sheet going straight downward? Uh, good it question. seems like some of the water is that because there was less water like it already flowed down when it once it hit the rock. And so there was yeah, just less so, water. So Wendell, you're talking about like this, this saturation zone um, is much thinner up top and and thicker down slope. And yeah. the, re the reason for that is because I'm on a hill slope. So if I was in flat ground, um, there would be no reason for this to be have this wedge shape. But because I'm on a hill slope, as soon as it infiltrates the soil, it starts moving down slope. And so you get more and more water being able to infiltrate the farther down slope you go. And so you get essentially more water infiltrating for longer amounts of time, the farther down slope we go. We can also see it if we, uh, if you look at how this thing saturates up. So this is right here is right as snow melt begins. Uh, where'd my slider go? So if I go to the next image, it actually, the soil saturates from the bottom of the slope up. And so it just has longer infiltration the farther down slope you go. So that's why you get this wedge 
that thickens as you go down slope and then really stays a wedge because you just infiltrated more water uh, farther down slope. So does that make sense? Yeah. And did that answer your question? I, yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm still, I think I, I think I do understand it. I think it, does it have something to do with the boundary between the soil and the rock? Yeah, so water's ponding on the boundary between the soil and the rock because the soil has higher hydraulic conductivity than the rock. So it infiltrates through the soil and then it gets kind of caught at the top of the rock. I need, I need I a larger head gradient to make it infiltrate down into the rock. And so I, mm. I saturate at the top of the rock. I have higher volumetric water content at the top of the bedrock. So once it does that, doesn't the excess water flow into the stream? So I don't know if you can see them, but there's these flow lines here. These lines right yeah. here, those are flow, those are just like your flow net. These are flow paths, right? Mm -hmm. And they're showing you what is happening to flow that originates in the top cell of the groundwater system or the bedrock system. So what happens okay. is this water flows straight down and then out and then out to, it actually exfiltrates into the soil at the base of the hill slope and then out of the soil and into the river. Okay. Um, in the soil, water is draining basically down all the time towards the river. Um, and um, so the, the, the water down here at the base of the slope Let's, this is say the end of winter or middle winter. This water is mostly coming from groundwater discharge into the soil, but some of it is water just continuing to drain down the soil towards the toe of the slope. So it's a mixture of those two types of water. Okay. But everything's draining down here to the river. All right, uh, any other questions about uh, the unsaturated zone stuff? Characteristic curves, these were done with uh, Van Genuchten equation. Um, Brooks Corey is just horrible to try and model with, but it, I, I've done it before, but it really slows, slows things down. All right, if not, I think we're uh, pretty close to time. Yeah, we are. Okay, so uh, we'll start Thursday talking about fracture flow. Um, I'll have office hours after this. So um, uh, starting at 10, I'll start office hours if you got questions on homework or whatever. And then, um, yeah, homework due Thursday. All right, no other questions, then we'll talk to you guys later. Have a good day and we'll see you on Thursday.